Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, hear about efforts to improve Arizona's international export trade. Also tonight, we'll learn about the Arizona-born songwriter who wrote Ghost Riders in the Sky. And we'll hear about an organization helping parents of murdered children. That's next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. The Phoenix Committee on Foreign Relations will present its 10th annual International State of the State on October 27th. Panelists will discuss a variety of trade-related issues, including numbers that show Arizona's international trade in decline while the U.S. rate is increasing. Joining us now is Keith Galbett. He's the chairman of the Phoenix Committee on Foreign Relations and Stephen Beschloss, an award-winning writer, journalist, and filmmaker. Good to have you all here. Thanks for Thank joining us. Thank you for having us. Good to be with you. Uh, Arizona's place in international trade. Where are we? Well, we have a lot of work to do. Uh, we've been making progress uh, over the years, and of course Arizona has a long history of strong international trading relationships, but we are falling behind, uh, and there's a lot more work to do for us to maintain par uh, and really get ahead. Our, for example, yes. uh, in, uh, in the Metro Phoenix area, which is the sixth largest city uh, in the country, uh, ranks 27th uh, as it relates to export trade. So there's a lot of work to be done. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, just jump in, I mean, that's, that's below San Antonio, it's below San, San Diego, it's below El Paso, it's below Greenville, South Carolina, and Peoria, Illinois. I mean, it, it just underscores the fact that uh, Arizona has been overly dependent on you know, tourism and uh, real estate and uh, you know, the kind of things that don't actually drive the uh, growth for the state. Is that the reason the d dependence on other things other than exporting out of the country? Well, I think historically there, there has been an over-dependence on a small number of industries to drive mm -hmm. Arizona's uh, progress, and, uh, you know, it's clear that that has to change. I mean, if you go back to 2008, you know, we really haven't even gotten back to that level uh, uh, since the Great Recession. We're still trying to get back to where we were then, and, you know, at a national level, the country is, is actually uh, at a record high in terms of its overall exports. Mm -hmm. And I was going to say, Ted, I think as well, we often in Arizona have short memories as it relates to recessions. We, during the recessionary period, think about uh, taking action steps towards diversifying our economy. But as uh, the recession generally closes and we start to lift out of it, uh, we forget. And one of the problems with, of course, the Great Recession is that this period uh, has been much longer than normal. Uh, and so it's uh, put a punctuation uh, on the need for us to diversify our economy more broadly. You mentioned that Arizona has a rich history as far as international trade is concerned. W what happened? What, what were we doing then that we may not be doing now? What, what are other states, the Greenville, South Carolinas, for goodness sake, what are they doing that we are not doing now? So my view is that there's a greater level of collaboration among the private sector and public sector leadership, uh, all aimed in a very direct and specific way at enhancing international trade. Uh, there needs to be a much greater level of enthusiasm because it really helps to create jobs and it really helps us uh, to advance our community uh, and to even out these ups and downs that we experience during recessionary and expansionary times. Should more enthusiasm, I mean, we, got, we have another country right at our doorstep here. Why is there not more enthusiasm? Well, that's, that's exactly right. I mean, uh, Mexico represents an extraordinary asset for Arizona's growth. I mean, it already represents one third of our total exports, even a little bit more than that. And if you look at what's happening in Mexico, I mean, you have major uh, automakers from around the world that are spending billions of dollars investing in the growth of the, you know, of their industries. Uh, they recognize opportunities that exist there, and you know, and we're still just kind of getting there. I mean, there's been a bump because you have uh, uh, the commitment on the part of uh, the city of Phoenix and others to open an office in Mexico City, and then you have uh, Mexico now committing to opening an office in Phoenix. So these things, they help, you know, they start to move the needle, but, but it, as Keith was saying, it's so important to be able to have groups that are focused on kind of global development who are giving people the tools that they need to do more exporting. What, what are some of those tools? What, what, what should be happening out there? Well, I think uh, on, on, the, on the theme of what is happening and how can things get better, uh, in the last 10 years, there's been a very substantial effort uh, put in play and uh, an enhanced level of leadership to further uh, international business. The efforts of the Greater Phoenix Economic Council, GPEC, the Commerce Authority, uh, groups like the Global Chamber, uh, led by Doug Brunke and regional groups uh, 
focusing on Arizona, for example, and Canadian growth led by Glenn Williamson are very, very helpful for advancing uh, those relationships. And so there is really a, a momentum. Uh, and in, our, in my view, uh, that momentum is really important because it gets people together to talk about opportunities and then people seize upon those opportunities and expand. And by the way, that's why the Phoenix Committee on Foreign Relations has sort of, you know, in the last few years has really started to focus more on how do you kind of bring people together to have those conversations, you know, not only to talk about kind of general global issues, but to really dig in and focus on, you know, what are the ways that we can begin to move the needle. And, you know, and, and partly it's a matter of building relationships. I mean, it sounds like a, you know, maybe a light thing to say, but if you want to start doing business in Malaysia, you know what, it helps if somebody can give you an introduction. Mm -hmm. so, so it's data, knowing how to go to those markets, and then it's being able to have the kind of introductions that allows you to function there successfully. 87% of exports, uh, Arizona exports, are from small and medium-sized firms. I is that a good thing? Is that a healthy thing? Well, I think it's a great thing, and I also think it's what Arizona is. Phoenix has always been about entrepreneurism. We're not a major headquarters for many large companies uh, and even regional headquarters, but we have a tremendous number of small and medium-sized enterprises who are entrepreneurial, who are, who are uh, you know, uh, interested in expanding, and, and, and so being that that is, in fact, the statistic that 87% uh, that are from small and medium-sized companies, we should really be focusing mm -hmm. on that uh, segment of the market to really expand. This correlates to employment as well. Uh, Trade-related employment, uh, grows at four times the average of non-trade related employment. So when we think about all the small and medium sized businesses that are within our community, if we can turbocharge that effort, it can make a big difference. And, and again, the, uh, aerospace, computer electronics, top merchandise export computer stuff, uh, transportation equipment was number two, uh, minerals and ores number well, three. Is, is, that, is that a nice portfolio or could we get a little more diversified? Well, d diversification is key to this whole thing. I mean, that's the whole conversation really, which is uh, not being dependent on a few things that uh, a company that semiconductors may be up in one year and then they may be down the next year. So uh, same thing with aerospace and military. So uh, what we're right now saying, if you have 7,000 businesses, which is that 87.5% that are uh, operating um, outside of Arizona that are recognizing the opportunities, that's great. But the question is, how do you get them to do more? How do you get them to focus on markets that they haven't looked at and really make a more uh, significant commitment to it? And in large part, that's what we're working on doing uh, at this coming Monday at the International State of the State. This is our 10th annual uh, State of the State, and we are focusing on uh, international trade, bringing together the minds of uh, the uh, education. Uh, Larry Penley is going to be moderating the panel, president of Thunderbird, as well as government, uh, Matt Salmon, representative Salmon, as well as representatives from the Chamber of Commerce and from uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, the Consul General is going to be there as well to try to bridge uh, this connectivity uh, to, to turbocharge these needs. We've got about a minute left here. I'm, a public, I'm an elected official. Uh, get, t tell me why I should really pay attention to this, why this is a big deal. Well, my uh, initial answer and most important, I think, uh, view is it's about jobs. It's about uh, increasing our economy and doing it in a very healthy way to create opportunities that currently don't exist or that we currently don't pursue. And uh, if we are able to really focus on that, it can make a big difference. Again, I'm an elected official. I hear about your con. I hear about exports. I, 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 Pitch me, pitch well, me. Well, you know what, do you want to have one term in office or would you like to have more? <laughs> so, so I would say, you know, the more diversified your economy is, which export trade can help you to, to uh, smooth that out, then you have a better chance of not just uh, winning when things are going well and not doing so well when things are going poorly. All right, sold. Uh, when is the event again? The event is Monday. It's a luncheon. It's at the Ritz-Carlton uh, in Phoenix at 24th Street in Camelback. And more information can be found at? At the uh, website, which is pcfraz.org. Uh, the Phoenix Committee on Foreign Relations. Good to have you both here. Thanks for joining Thank us. Thank you very you. much.
Ghost Riders in the Sky, a cowboy legend, is an iconic American song made popular by a number of performers, including Vaughn Monroe, who had a big hit back in 1949. That very familiar song was written by Arizona native Stan Jones, who had quite a life in and out of show business. And that life is chronicled in a new biography written by Tucson writer Michael Ward. And we welcome Michael Ward to Arizona Horizon. Good to have you here. Thank you so much, Ted. Appreciate it. Who was Stan Jones? Stan Jones uh, was born in Douglas in 1914. And he uh, grew up, his, his, his father, Stan was not a planned arrival, and his father had abandoned the family uh, when, before Stan was born. So his mom struggled to raise him in uh, what was a pretty shaky economy after the World War I was, was over and the copper boom kind of quit uh, in Douglas. But uh, Stan uh, grew up in Douglas for most of his adolescence and uh, spent a lot of time on the cattle ranches east of Douglas. He and his buddies would round up burrows, stray burrows, oh that were there, and they would hop out there. And a good friend of his had a grandfather that owned a cattle ranch. So this is where Stan got much of the inspiration for the songs that he wrote later as an adult. And he was a, I, I moved to LA apparently. Your book, rodeo writer, joined the Navy, a miner, a firefighter, and eventually a, 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 a park ranger. A National Park Service ranger. He wrote the song In Death Valley when he was a park ranger. He, he had a wonderful old uh, stone ranger station that was built by the Civilian Conservation Corps, immigrant ranger station. And uh, his widow, Olive, bless her heart, who just turned 96 and is still with us. Oh, my goodness. Told me that he wrote it on 10 minutes on a Sunday morning. So I, I was going to ask you, was he, was he just staring at the sky? Was it a beautiful day, a cloudy day? At Death Valley, it's got to be a hot day. Uh, we don't know exactly what day it was. And, and of course, the story is that the clouds were there. And yeah, reminded yeah. Him. But he just had that image branded into his imagination from when he was about 10 years old. There was an old cowboy named Cap Watts that befriended Stan when he was spending his time out on the ranches east of Douglas. And Cap Watts was born during the Civil War and he was a real McCoy. He had cowboyed across the West and had carried this legend with him. There's a couple stories about where the where that legend actually came from, but he imprinted that into Stan's imagination, supposedly when there was a really violent thunderstorm and they were working on a windmill together and, yeah. and Cap told Stan that there were, there were riders, cowboys up there that were going to round up the clouds and, and uh, staunch the rain, but, but that, that stayed with him. So he, he took that and, and the, the genius of this song is that it's very biographical because when Stan was sitting on that ranger station for the first time in his life, he was probably as settled and as happy as he had ever been. He was kind of a rake and rambling boy during the Depression. As you mentioned, he, he, he went from job to job. Mm -hmm. There were a couple of failed marriages, kids. He, he really struggled throughout his adolescence. And yet he wrote songs all the while. It wasn't like he just sat out there and all of a sudden decided to write a song. He, he was... It's really hard to pin down. I, I was amazed I found anything from that Depression yeah. period because yeah. there's many members of his family that had no idea where, where Stan was uh, during, during those years. But uh, he, he met uh, Olive in Bend, Oregon, and they were married in 1944, and, and she remained his partner for the rest of her life. So when he wrote that song, he made it a, a tale of redemption, essentially, almost like a biblical kind of parallel, sure. uh, parable. Uh, Cowboy, change your ways today. And so that's exactly what Stan had experienced. And so he took that ghostwriter's image, he took that life lesson, combined them and made, uh, created and composed a very, very powerful song. And a powerful song, how quickly was this song? I mean, it, it obviously it changed his life. How quickly did it change his life? Well, it, it's interesting because when, it, when Bob Monroe version first came out, Burl Ives recorded it first, but he recorded it just on 12-string guitar and, and it was popular, but, but nothing like the Bob Monroe version that came out in April of 1949. Uh, Stan's uh, communications weren't instantaneous between Death Valley and, and Hollywood. Sure. Uh, but Stan got noticed that there was a royalty check waiting for him in L.A. 
1949, his first check was $100,000. Oh, my goodness. So, of course, what's a red-blooded American Arizona boy do? He, he bought a brand new Oldsmobile, <laughs> drove back to Death Valley, but he was still a park ranger and wanted to remain a park ranger. He loved his job. As a ranger. So he was settled to the point, when you said he was settled, he was settled enough to know that the $100,000, maybe some more is going to come, but he was still happy in his life. Yes. He, there was no guarantees that the Ghost Riders uh, was going to carry him forward. And here he was for the first time in his life. He had a working for the government, working outdoors, had a job he loved. He had all the attendant government benefits. And he didn't want to just throw all that to the wind because he, he couldn't see down the road. But it became clear, he asked for a, le a year's leave of absence, but he and the superintendent didn't get along because he wanted to stand to shoot burrows, and Stan wouldn't do that ah. because he loved burrows from his youth. Yeah, yeah. And so the superintendent was just, we just wanted to get rid of Stan because people were starting to, 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 to flock into Death Valley and they wanted to meet the singing ranger and they wanted to meet Stan Jones. And, and, and it, just, it just came to a head and Stan finally had to retire. And eventually it was very clear that they were going to um, you know, coast for quite a while just on the, on the royalties alone. But he, the song. but he did wind up going to Hollywood, worked on some John Ford films, and yes. wasn't, wound up being an actor. Yes, and to, uh, Stan himself was his best uh, objective critic. He goes, I'm no actor and I have the film to prove it. <laughs> <laughs> he, the, the problem was, he was, he, he was a happy little guy. Johnny Western, his friend, um, really, really excellent friend, said that Stan always had that little kid gleam in his eye. Mm -hmm. And he always had that. Whenever he was on screen, if he find anything that he did, he was on the Spin and Marty show, he was on um, Sheriff of Cochise, which was a, 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 a serial Western. He, he always had, he was, looked like he was always smiling inside. Yeah, yeah. And as an actor, you know, you want to you look sad or cry every now and again. Stan just couldn't do it. And, and he wound up dying young at the age of 49. What happened there? He had cancer issues. Oh, my goodness. Oh, was he a heavy smoker? I he was a heavy smoker, um, but he had some melanoma issues also back then. From there, being outdoors all the time. From being outdoors all the time. Um, and, and it was interesting because he, his good friend Dobie Carey told me that, that Stan had a premonition that he wasn't going to be around much beyond the, the age of 50. And he had told them that you know, many years before, and it, it proved to be true. Isn't that interesting? Why did you write this book? What about, has anyone written about Stan Jones? Well, that's, that surprised me because this started as I lived in Death Valley for about 15 years before I moved to Tucson. And um, I wanted to write a piece for a Death Valley History Conference on Stan Jones and his life as a ranger in Death Valley. And I started doing a little research, and, and there was essentially nothing written about him. It, it really surprised me. Yeah. There, there was nothing known. And I found out that his, uh, his widow, Olive, bless her heart, was alive and agreed to, to sit with me and tell me about their years uh, in Death Valley together, which, was, which led to, to many many little avenues about what Stan was up to because there was nothing. People in his family didn't know what he was up to. I, I really don't know. The, the first eyewitness I account of him actually playing and singing guitar is from uh, a fellow who knew him in Mount Rainier where his first Park Service Ranger job, and that was 1945. Wow. So I don't know when he learned to play the guitar or, or how long he'd been playing the guitar. And there's that guitar too, huh? And what's really interesting, this is a four-string tenor guitar. Oh. I don't think too many people know that one of the great songs of the 20th century was written on what is essentially an oversized ukulele. Yeah. Um, it was designed um, on, uh, from a tenor banjo in the 1920s. And the strings, you could either tune it like a tenor banjo or you could tune it the first four strings guitar of a, of a guitar, standard guitar, which is what Stan did. And that was his uh, uh, guitar of choice and that was a gift from Olive. And so I, I'm guessing that once Olive gave him this gift, because she knew he was trying to write cowboy stories, he yeah, was writing yeah. songs, and this was a gift from her saying, you know, I really support you, Stan. I really want you to carry this through. Have you had much reaction to the book? What, what are you hearing from folks? I'm, I'm getting some really, really wonderful responses from, from, from people. Um, it's, it's such an interesting, it's, it's a classic American rags to riches story. Yeah. Um, he was, it was so interesting. You know, he's kind of saddled with the ghost riders in the sky. Uh, thing. I mean, like that's, it's his stairway to heaven. I mean, it's, it's, it's yeah. like that's the one that, but he wrote, he was a prolific creative writer all the way through to the, to the end of his life. He wrote songs for, for the Walt Disney Company, for, for films, you know, especially John Ford. He wrote the, uh, the theme song for the Searchers, which goodness, is widely yes. known as, as John Ford's Greatest Western. Yes. And he wrote the theme song for the Spin and Marty show, <laughs> which was the number one <laughs> children's song in 1957. Uh, he wrote a great cowboy gospel song called Saddle Up. Um, he, he was just, he kept writing good songs and, and uh, 
He, he, was, he was a very, very interesting guy. And oh. I, I'm really, it, it's, it's odd. I, I think it was the Death Valley connection for me, the fact I lived there so long. When I was there, I used to, I, wrote, yeah. I started writing songs when I was in Death Valley. I, and I went to work for the National Park Service. Stan works for the National Park Service. And then I moved to Tucson, and Stan was from Southern Arizona. So there's just all these different currents where yeah. we just kind of seem to intersect. And uh, here, here's the book. Well, congratulations on the book. Uh, good job and a good read. Thanks for joining us. We Thank you so it. much, Ted. I appreciate it. Get the inside scoop on what's happening at Arizona PBS. Become an aid insider. You'll receive weekly updates on the most anticipated upcoming programs and events. Get the aid insider delivered to your email inbox. Visit azpbs.org to sign up today. Tonight's edition of Arizona Giving and Leading looks at a group that helps parents cope with devastating loss. Oh, the lands of the free. On a sunny Saturday and afternoon, home. a group gathers at Encanto Park in Phoenix. It's a group that doesn't want to see its numbers grow, but it does. Robert Carl Hernandez. I think there's 1,409 currently named. Including Becky Miller's child. I first got involved with parents of murdered children about three months after my 18-year-old son Brian was robbed and shot to death in Phoenix in October of 1991. The local chapter of Parents of Murdered Children provided the understanding Becky couldn't find anywhere else. It's the most devastating event a parent or a loved one can go through. You can lose someone to illness and accident and it's still, it's still the most, it's still very difficult. But when it's cold-blooded murder, it adds another dimension that nobody's ever prepared for. I felt like I wanted the world to stop. I wanted to tell him, don't you guys understand? My son was murdered, hey, time out. And everybody was going on with their lives. Maricela Carrion's life changed in September 2003. That's when her son Jesse, her nephew Timmy, and their friend Hector were killed. For me, I didn't work for nine months after that. I couldn't. And all I wanted to do was sleep. And I thought, if I could just sleep, and sleep long enough, then I don't have to feel this pain. The pain hasn't disappeared, but Maricela has learned to live with it, thanks to parents of murdered children. Still, there was something the group couldn't fix, the pain that consumed Jesse's older sister. We were best friends and often people thought we were twins because we were so close. Years went by before Juliet used a Mother's Day card to express her sorrow. I said, hey, I am alive. I'm still here and I very much need you. I need my mom. And it was like the light bulb went off for her. And I wanted to respect her time frame of grieving, and I didn't want to sound selfish, but I did need her. And she apologized, and ever since that day, I feel that she lives her life for a purpose. I need this in order to make it through each day. Cherished photos and happy memories bring comfort, and so does little Jessie, the girl born three months after her father died. Split image of him. Her demeanor, her, the way she acts, her, she loves sports. She, she's exactly like him, exactly like him. If we don't remember, then how will we ever affect the change that it's going to take to stop the violence from happening in the first place? Back at Encanto Park, Becky Miller oversees a ceremony observing the National Day of Remembrance for murder victims. Jackie Vanessa Reese. Carrie Lee Almond. Brianna Amelia Naylor. Jeffrey David Bellamy. Jessica Dion, Timmy Vallejo, and Hector Hernandez. Some might find it easier to flee the tears rather than keep facing them, but not Becky. 
I handle it because somebody was there for us when we needed them to hear. And so many of your family and friends, um, it's hard for them to hear about it. And they want their life to get back to normal and they want you to get back to normal. And yet that's not something you ever get to do. You actually have to rebuild. Or sometimes I say redesign your life. While the redesign includes loss, it also includes the addition of an extended family. And while they never wanted to join this group, they are grateful to be part of it. In addition to monthly support groups and workshops, Parents of Murdered Children offers guidance for families navigating the criminal justice system. And you can learn about the group at POMC.com. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening.